it's really important, especially if you're not represented. It's really important to understand that you need to look at your file before the hearing. Because a lot of people think Social Security just automatically goes and gets their medical records. And it's really important to understand that Social Security at the application and request for reconsideration or recon level will go get your medical records. Generally speaking, that's what they do. But at the hearing level, the vast majority of those cases, do they do not go get the medical record. It is your obligation as the claimant to prove your case. So then... You will, if you don't look at your file before the hearing, they may and likely, highly likely, have at least a year, if not more, of missing medical documentation and missing medical records that they're not even able to evaluate because it's not there. Hey, Jack, how you doing? I'm good, Peter. How are you? I am great. I am great. Thanks for asking. So today, I, I, I'm again, I'm grateful for your time and appreciate any time that we get to spend together. Um, and I was thinking about how many hearings you and I have done between the two of us. And I think you said, I, I think a good estimate, and I know at this point we both have probably lost track, but a good estimate is about 4,500 hearings, give or take. That's about right. That's about right. I, I've been at it a while, and there were years when I would do, you know, on the road I might do, I don't know if I did 500 hearings a year, but sometimes. You know. Yeah, so quite a few hearings. I, I mean, yeah. needless to say, you have a lot of experience in hearings. And I've been trying to estimate, too, over the last 21 years of uh, being involved in hearings, you know, especially in my early days, I, I think I'm sort of at the six to 7,000 <laughs> hearing, hearings as well. Um, but I've lost count. So, so much of it is an estimate. But one of the things that I thought you and I could talk about to either potential clients or our current clients or folks who kind of want to get a little bit behind the scenes of what it is that, you know, either we do or should be done to prepare a person for their social security disability hearing. And you and I have kind of worked off on a list uh, this past week, uh, and we've come up with sort of nine things uh, that should be done uh, in order to be prepared for a social security disability hearing. And the first thing on that list we wrote down, which is to the clients who are not represented, is go hire a lawyer. Go hire a lawyer who's experienced in social security disability hearing. Um, not just any lawyer, someone who knows what social security rules and regulations and the law, uh, and, and, uh, and engage their services. And I'm curious of why you believe that should be, uh, kind of the number one thing. And at the top of the list, uh, when you sent over the notes, uh, I had, a, I had a thought about that one. You've done a lot of criminal defense. I've done a lot of criminal defense. How many stories do you have where you said to this person or wish you'd said or wish you could have said, if you would come to see me about this earlier, you would not be in this mess? Right. Many times. Many right. times. Right. You know, it, this is something that even if if a case is put together properly by someone who knows what he's doing, then you may never have to see a judge. Now, if you are in a situation where you know you're going to have to see a judge. You're going to go hire a lawyer, right? Right. Suppose someone tells you if you hire a lawyer at the beginning, you might not have to see the judge. Right. You'd go hire a lawyer, right? Right. Right. Exactly. And everyone who comes in to see us, Peter, they don't come in on a winning streak. They got money going on in their life that they don't have to try and handle their own lawsuit. It's our job to reduce all that stress, give you some hope at the end of the tunnel, let you know what we actually can do to help. Right. Ask my thoughts on that. What do you think? Well, oh, those are great thoughts. I think um, I think there's things about hiring someone who's been there before and to know what to expect. Little things like you you need to know that in the vast majority and and. I'm, this is a guess, but I would say that 95% of the social security hearings I've ever been in, there's a vocational expert, 
So you're going to need to know and be, be prepared to cross-examine an expert witness. You're going to need to know, uh, and, and a lawyer who's experienced in this will know how to do that. You know, 95% of the cases I've been in, they ask to give an opening statement or a theory of the case, you know, and a lawyer will be well prepared to know the law, to know the procedures, to know to know the, uh, you know, the palms and, and the CFRs that go along with, you know, what it means to prove you're disabled. The sequential evaluation, for example. Um, and knowing those elements, having a, a, a professional, you know, a lawyer, to walk in, to know the elements, to know what it takes. And if you have a seasoned and experienced judge too, I've seen hearings, and I'm sure as you have too, last like five minutes, where because there's a single one or two issues, and then the lawyer and the judge will work it out, ask a few questions to the client, and the case is done, and the judge will say, you win. And so that sort of experience with the unknown will help set up a successful case. And... One of the things about our firm that I love is that every lawyer that works for our firm has done thousands of hearings, you know, maybe closer to 1,000 versus, you know, 5,000, but have done thousands of hearings. We even have a former Social Security law judge who's doing hearings for us as well. And the other th great thing about hiring a lawyer is it can be done on a contingency fee. As you know, Congress and Social Security regulates how lawyers can be paid. And so we don't bill by the hour in the traditional sense of give us a big retainer up front, you know, give us five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. But instead, what we say is, look, let's make a deal. If you win, the client, if the client wins, we get a percentage of the back pay, 25%, but then there's a cap. You can get no more than 7200 bucks. So if the back pay is 10000 then our cut is 2500 And if the back pay is 100000 Social Security says, no, you can only get 7200 and even the better part about it, and I'm a firm believer in all ships rising together, is that if the client doesn't win, they don't owe us a thing. We don't come after them for money. So, you know, those are kind of my thoughts about why they should hire a lawyer. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that. So the second thing that uh, I wrote down and that we kind of worked on together is the second reason, um, the second thing to do to prepare for your Social Security hearing was to know when and where your hearing's going to be and how it's going to be presented. And what are your thoughts on that? This is a very, like a lot of things, it's a very different question from how it was a few years ago. Uh, like I said, you and I both had a, a trial practice before we started doing this kind of work. Used to make it a practice, okay. Show your client where the courtroom is. This is where you're going to be sitting. This is where I'm going to be sitting. This is where the judge sits. And, and you know, going to court is a little bit like going to a foreign country. You know, they, speak, they sort of speak English there, but not right, quite. And, you know, all of a sudden, everyone around you stands up. You don't know why, so you stand up too. And so your lawyer is supposed to get you settled and ready for this. Now, you can try and do that yourself. When you get the notice from Social Security, it says, here's the time and place, and we're going to either call you or we'll send you a link on the on your computer, and you can hook yourself up and we'll talk to you. And then at that time and place, you're supposed to answer your phone or turn on your computer and be ready to put on your case. So there's a lot to do between now and then, but this is, you're right, this is the first step. If I were going through that, I'd want somebody who did it all the time to help me with it. But I guess the takeaway, if you're going to try and do it yourself, is it's all in the notice. If you have any questions, call and ask Social Security, and good luck with that. Or maybe you want to hire a lawyer for that. I hate to keep piping on that, but that might be the most <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's, it's great advice. I think it's why we put it right at the top. So I, I love that. I think there, you know, for most people, you should know there's four different ways you can have a hearing, right? These days. And it's really post pandemic or during the pandemic. Frankly, there was only like two ways you could have a hearing during the pandemic. Yeah. Now there's four. You have a telephone hearing, which is what we recommend, at least I do. Uh, so you can do it all by phone from the comfort of your own home. 
You can do a Zoom-like hearing or MS Teams, which is a video conference type hearing, all from your computer or your iPhone or smart pad from home. Uh, you can do an in-person hearing still where you go down to your local Social Security hearings office, which is a little bit different than your local Social Security office. Like, for example, in Oregon, there's only two. Two hearings offices in the whole state, and that's Portland and Eugene. So if you don't live close to that, you're going to be driving into Portland or driving into Eugene, uh, looking for parking, going through security, and you will be right in front of the judge uh, face to face uh, you know, or you know, 15 feet away. Uh, and then the fourth type is what they call VTC. Now, I don't know why anyone would ever choose to be a VTC. I, I have no uh, logical reason why anyone would choose that. But that is basically uh, VTC is an internal video system within the Social Security hearings office where you still have to go into your local hearings office, whether, you know, whatever the closest major city is that has a hearings office. And you got it, your judge is anywhere in the country. So you might as well do MS Teams. I don't know why they still have the VTC system. My guess is that's going to become obsolete soon. Um, do you have a preference on what kind of hearings uh, of those four that you like to do? Well, 90% uh, of the time, the thing that's best for me may, and maybe more, the thing that's best for the, for the client is the phone hearing. So that's the straightest answer. Now, I like courthouses. I like talking to people in person. I think there are some few cases where it's better appreciated in person or video. In that case, you got to decide, should this person request a video hearing? Or, or is there something that the judge really needs to see and hear? Because you do have a right to that. And we're very careful to explain that you do have this right to have your case heard and decided by a person who's been in the same room with you, looked you in the eye. Some people just prefer that. I would prefer not to have to go through security. I would prefer not to have to drive over the pass to Eugene. I would prefer not to any of the problems. And that's just me. And I'm not really disabled. So I, if any of the problems our clients already have are not going to be made better by having to travel. There are some cases where if you really don't think the judge will appreciate your problems in person, uh, and they might have, or you can't, we have clients with serious mental health issues who just can't sit through a hearing uh, or can't sit through a phone call. There are some times when you don't have another good choice, uh, but so what's best for the client is phone hearing. What I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, and I, I actually did a whole video on it um, on our website. Why, uh, why I think phone hearings um, are actually better than in-person hearings. You know, I was once in a hearing and, and I'm friendly with all the judges. I, you know, I have a great relationship, great working relationship with almost, almost every single judge I've ever been in front of. And one of the judges told me, if I can see the claimant open that hearing room door on their own, I instantly believe they can push 15 to 20 pounds. Or, and then they also said, if I see the claimant pour themselves a glass of water, I know they can lift 10 to 15 pounds. Because, you know, that big jug of water in the hearing rooms, it's heavy. And they're making physical evaluations as if they're a doctor. Um, and, and they're not asking questions about it, right? I, I once had a judge, because one of the questions that's really popular, as you know, is, how long can you sit before you must stand up? Or how long can you sit before you need to stand up? And the claimant or the claimant or the clients are sitting there. And, and by the time this question comes, it's like 30 minutes into the hearing. Yeah. Third, give or take. And the clients will be like, Oh, I can only sit for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. And the judge will go, well, on the record, you've been sitting there for 30 minutes and you've yet to stand up. And so they're making, they become their own witnesses in an in-person hearing. And so generally speaking, and not just generally speaking, but the law says they need to evaluate the claimant's testimony and the medical records and the medical file and the written evidence, the testimony, not their observations of what's going on in a moment. Right? How often have you seen that, Jack, where they do that? That's ex Well, that's exactly right. And we can unpack that a little bit. Part of that is is having a properly prepared witness, 
Right. Because either you don't do it or you have an answer ready. Ask your lawyer what you want to do about that. <laughs> the other thing is, when you're actually in that hearing and a judge behaves that way toward a layperson, someone who's never been in court before, hasn't been in court since they were a kid over a speeding ticket or something, and the judge gets heavy with you, that's that's going to knock you off your stride. You might not remember what you wanted to say next. But if you, that's not something that ought to happen to a lawyer who's putting on cases. So another good argument for people to bring their lawyer when they come to this thing, because the courtroom is a different place. Right, right. What are cases that you think where the value of going in person might outweigh sort of what we just talked about, uh, the phone hearing? Or, or instead of it, sorry to cut you off, but instead of, or maybe not necessarily in person, but even MS Teams where you can visually see uh, the client and the judge. It, it's harder to tell now because we used to, we used always to meet with the client in person beforehand and you could see something that you wanted the judge to see. Not so much anymore. So you have to be very careful in your evaluation. I think about tremors. There are some mobility problems that I don't think you can properly appreciate unless somebody, you know, unless you see it in person, you just don't get what the problems is, problems are by reading medical records and listening to someone describe their problems on stairs or curb stones or whatever it is. Um, you know, we represent a lot of people with serious mental health issues. Honestly, some of our clients smell, and we want the judge to be able to appreciate that. Uh, it's not an easy practice. People don't come to us with pleasant problems, and sometimes you just can't appreciate them. But those same people also have problems getting into court, so it's a good thing that most of these are done by phone now. Right, right. I, I kind of, I've, I've also thought about obesity. Yeah, you know, it, it can be. I've heard judges, you know, and I again just talking to judges off the record and. And again, luckily, we have a former Social Security judge who we happen to be, both of us are happen to be good friends with, uh, yeah. who now works for the firm. But some stuff is just is is just so in your face shocking that it's hard to deny, you know, amputees, for example, or things like that, that just kind of move the judge. But generally speaking, you know, vast majority, majority of our cases are not that. So then we end up saying like, look, we don't want the judge to make an evaluation on how you look or how you present. We want them to be, make an evaluation on your testimony and the medical records. So, right. no, those are those are pearls of wisdom. So the third thing we wrote down uh, in order to be prepared for your hearing is to review your medical file. Now, why would we write that down, Jack? Because medical evidence is the fuel that makes this motor run. Because if you don't have a doctor who's saying that you can or can't do this, you can or can't do that. And here's the reason in these medical tests and exams that explains it. You might as well not show up. So when, I, when we say review the medical file, it's not enough just to read it. You have to understand it. Maybe your doctor or someone at your doctor's office will go over it with you. You might have a friend who understands medical terminology or go to the library. The judge will understand it for sure, right? And a lawyer will understand it for sure. And you've got to know what all this indicates it means, how severe this is, and how it matches up with the legal standards that the judge is going to use to evaluate your medical condition. So these are right. interesting. Yeah, these are interesting cases because they live in the sort of middle ground between law and medicine. A lot of cases are like that, and and it and it it doesn't make for simple litigation. Yeah, one thing I would add to that is that it's really important, especially if you're not represented, it's really important to understand that you need to look at your file before the hearing. Because a lot of people think Social Security just automatically goes and gets their medical records. And it's really important to understand that Social Security at the application and request for reconsideration or recon level will go get your medical records, generally speaking, that's what they do. But at the hearing level, the vast majority of those cases, do they do not go get the medical record. It is your obligation as the claimant to prove your case. So then 
you will, if you don't look at your file before the hearing, they may and likely, highly likely, have at least a year, if not more, of missing medical documentation and missing medical records that they're not even able to evaluate because it's not there, right? And so it's really important to review your file, look closely what's there, and then also what are the dates of those medical records that they have. Because that's that way we can know, uh, or the client will know, what to go order and what to get and to make sure those medical files are there. And then to your point, once it's there, what are what is the judge looking for in these medical records? And reading it in such a way, we talked about it when we talked about why you should hire a lawyer, but pointing out specific page numbers and paragraphs in your medical file that the, that will help assist the judge to positive evidence that supports your disability claim. You know, and you there's another side of that coin I, that I just thought of while you were talking about this. You want to know what's in there because there's going to be some, there might be some stuff in there that wouldn't surprise you. A lot of our clients have had workers' comp cases. Yesterday I was talking with a guy and going over a long workers' comp doctor's opinion on his condition, which was used to close his claim because he didn't get a lawyer for it. Mm. And I, and I said to the guy, this is not good. And I, and he said, yeah, but that's before I saw Dr. So-and-so. And Dr. So-and-so, who actually examined me and treated me, found this. I said, okay, that now you're looking at it the right way. But right. isn't that, wouldn't that be a nasty surprise to get the first time when you were in front of the judge? Right, right. Yeah. And that's what a lawyer can do is to help prepare you. Um, on number four, we wrote down, get the missing medical records. And I, I think I covered that, but do you have any, any two cents to add to that? I love what you say. What is it that you say? It's medical records are the... The fuel that makes this motor run. Yeah, I love that. I love that. So, or, so the fourth thing is, look at your medical file, see what's missing, go get it. The other thing that we do is we look at a medical file and we'll pre-read it and have a precursory to it. And we're looking for also not just medical record, right? Because also in that medical file is a lot of times our consultative examinations that's done by Social Security. Mm -hmm. And if there's one that's, and a lot of them are, if there are ones that's not negative or that are negative to the claim, maybe what we do is we push, we ask our clients, hey, look, do you have a supportive doctor? So we can send out one of our questionnaires to have them answer or have your doctor's opinion to uh, combat, for lack of a better term, the consultative exam that's really hurting your case. You know, so I think ordering medical records, knowing what's missing, know, and then how to, how to, uh, you know, what, are, and, and just off the top of your head, I, it's not kind of on our list. What are other things that you will look for if like, that's like, what if someone's working part-time, they're not necessarily over SGA, what, what would you then advise a client to go get for the file? Uh, you might want to get your pay stubs. Yeah. You might want to you might want to get anything that your boss has put in writing about any variation from your normal duties. This guy can only work four hours a day. This guy shouldn't have to put his hands in hot water. Whatever it is that your boss doesn't let doesn't need you to do, anything that's we call them accommodations, as you know. That's, uh, that's right. School records are often important in these cases, especially for younger people, people with mental health issues. If you've got trouble getting to school or getting through the school day, you're likely to have the same problems when you enter the work workplace. Um, those are the two that come to mind right away. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and oftentimes, um, I, w I won't say often, but every once in a while, we'll meet someone who's perhaps taking one or two college classes, uh, you know, or in school while they're trying to go through their disability uh, case and that will definitely be questioned at the hearing. You know, um, I think full time school is treated like full time work. It it is, but there's a little bit of sort of legal judo to that. That is to say, if when you flip it around, you say, "Yes, my client is in school full time. Here's their plan from the from the Student Disabilities Access Office that they need a note taker and they have mobility issues and they need extra time. So, would you please add this to the file, Your Honor? 
Right. But if you're not represented or if you're not aware that that's even an issue because it's not work and social security makes it definitely a big deal out of work, you may not go get those records, which kind of leads us into our next topic, which number five of our nine is the five day rule letter, because you may walk into a hearing thinking this is important and you don't, and if you're not represented, you don't know all the, all the rules and regulations. What maybe you can explain to our audience what the five day rule letter is. Yes, the five day le- rule. Uh, when you and I started practicing in this court, there was no five day rule. Yeah, and people were filing eight hundred pages of medical records the day before the hearing after having added nothing to the file for six months. So Social Security made a rule: when you get a piece of evidence, send it in right away. We know that you're still developing your file because your client is still in treatment. They don't stop treating three months before the hearing. So five days, five business days before the hearing, one week, write to us and notify us, here is all the evidence that we have requested that hasn't come in yet. Here's why I want to file it. Would you please hold the record open, judge? Now, you'll know better than do I, but that's not easy to track if you have one case. I imagine you must have a mechanism for that. (laughs) We do. We do. Yeah. Let me ask you this. If you don't turn in the five-day letter that outlines what's missing, you know, and, and I'm speaking to a lot, large in part to folks who uh, just say, hey, I want to go at this and try it myself. Yep. And then you get to the courtroom and you run into, you know, and every judge is going to treat it a little bit different. So I don't want to say, but by law, they can basically do what if you don't turn in a five-day rule letter? They, they will say... Even a, even a cranky or grumpy judge will say something nice like, what's your excuse for not having this evidence? And then they'll listen to your excuse. If they like your excuse, when they want to give you a break, they'll say, get it to me in a week or something like that. Or they could say, too late, I'm not going to consider this evidence. And that sounds unfair to us, but that's the rule. That is the rule. Um, and... You're absolutely right. Like the judge has the discretion, the legal discretion to not accept evidence that post hearing. And you may not even known that it was missing. If you didn't review your medical file, you may not have known that you had to submit a letter five full business days to the, uh, uh, so, uh to the judge explaining, here's what's missing. I'm one working on it. You know, we use school records as an example. I've been trying to get my school records and I, here's all the attempts I've made. Um, and and then go from there and trying to understand, um, you know, explaining to the judge. And then if you turn in the five day rule letter, the judge's legal options become a little bit less, like it's a little bit more restrictive. I guess is be the better term for on the judge. You can't just instantly deny it in some ways, you know. Right. You um, you protected your rights. You put the court on notice, and you protected your rights. Yeah, and then speaking of cranky judges, we talked about number six on the list. Know your audience. Who is your judge? Um, And why is that so important, Uh, Jack? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I guess we're looking at that from the point of view of trying to represent yourself. Sure. Uh, Yeah. Most people are a little bit anxious going to court anyway. It's not a pleasant experience for them. It's not something they do all the time. And if on top of that, uh, there's this stranger on the phone with you asking you all these extremely personal questions about all these very unpleasant subjects, and they're doing so in an unpleasant manner, are you going to be able to get full and complete and accurate answers? Probably not. Probably not. Now, some judges are not like that. I'm going to say most judges want to hear your evidence. But if the judge doesn't want to hear your case, are you going to be able to stick it in the judge's ear? I don't know. Yeah. You can. Uh, but, it, you know, you know, that for years I was, I, I worked for a national firm that handled these cases. And they used to have a a continuing legal education meeting in New York City with all the lawyers in the country who work for the firm. And my talk, they asked me to give a talk, and it was on this, handling difficult judges. 
Now, the best trick, the best way to get ready to handle a difficult judge is to go out and practice law for 15 years. Yeah. Other than that, know the file and try and keep calm. But that's about all a client, a, a, a late person can do. And, and when you say know the judge, some judges are easy to get along with. But if they're not. Yeah. But, um, I think for me, um, you know, and obviously we don't know every single judge, Social Security judge in the country. Um, you know, for me, when I think about knowing your audience, I think of a couple of things or a few things. One, I think about some judges really, really, really want, if not require, a written memorandum before the hearing that outlines the case. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and expect that to be turned in, especially, you know, especially if you're a lawyer. And it's helpful to know that before you go in front of the judge because if you turn that in for that particular judge, you will you've already made kind of smooth things over going into the hearing. But I know judges who absolutely hate those in the record. <laughs> so, so it's a catch twenty two. If you don't know the like, does this judge want a memo? I've reached out to lawyers in other jurisdictions to ask about, hey, can you tell me a little bit about in, give me some insight into the local judge? And you know, I'm part of a national group of uh, Oscar uh, national group of, and I think you might be a member too. If not, if not, you should be. Um, but Oscar lawyers that will reach out to you and be like, Hey, can you tell us about judge so-and-so how's what's that like? You know, so that that's one thing, you know, the other thing too is social security publishes the statistics of win percentage, deny percentage and dismiss percentage uh, on the judge. So you sort of know kind of how high is this burden of proof, you know, and you and I, you mentioned us doing criminal law. Well, the burden of proof in criminal law is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And in Social Security law, it is not that. In fact, in Social Security law, it's preponderance of the evidence, um, which is if you've ever been to traffic court, which <laughs> unfortunately I have been, they'll tell you, if well, if I 51% believe that you're broke the speed, you know, the speed limit, I'm going to have to find you, you know, guilty of this traffic ticket. Well, if they 51%, if that's really the case in social security world, it's 51% of, I think you might be disabled more likely than not by 1%. I'll find you disabled. But as you and I both know, <laughs> walk me through. It's in a lot of cases, at least in my experience, and you know, I've been in, I've been around the block once or twice, like you, it feels like proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, it does. And I want to be fit out of the judges on this. And this is a perspective that I think the client should have too. Uh, Let's say, let's say, I'm going to pick out some figures here. Uh, Someone who's drawing social security disability at $1,500 a month, out of a middle of the road rate, that's $18,000 a year. And if they're going to draw that for 15 years, there's a $270,000 claim plus health insurance. And that's not something that you ought to decide if you just get kind of pushed over the one yard line. So judges should be skeptical. They should follow the law. There's no doubt about it. But you're right that some judges can be tough. And that's how you kind of turn this question the other way. It's not so much who your audience is as the target you're aiming at. If you're going to talk about the theory of disability in a little bit, cranky judges still have to follow the law, still have to pay attention and respect the evidence. And so if you've got a tough judge, well, see what you can do with your case instead of the judge. And that's where things like we'll talk about, I'm sure we'll talk about the grids. I'm sure we'll talk about sustainability. I'm sure we'll talk about SSR 212P and all that stuff. So it's important to have some legal background in this which is probably a good reason to hire a lawyer if you're going to pursue one of these cases. Agreed. I, you know, we're at, we're at the, um, six point and we keep referring back to point one, um, hire a lawyer who knows what they're doing. Right. 
Um, strictly accidental on my part. I mean, it just keeps coming back <laughs> up. No, I, it is a good point. I, you know, and I appreciate your time. I, for sure, I would, I, and you and I rarely disagree, but I would disagree a little bit. I get your point of perspective. I don't think it is the judge's job and this, and we're going to have to agree to disagree and then we'll yeah. move on to the next point. Cause you and I could probably go back and forth on this for hours. I don't think it's the judge's job to be the gatekeeper or the accountant or the CPA of the trust, the social security trust. I don't think they should even take that into consideration. How much money is this person getting for the next, next, you know, 25, 35, 40 years. I, and I'm not saying that that's what you said, but I don't think it's their job. I, I've had a judge actually tell me, I see myself as the guardian and the gatekeeper of the trust of social security. And unfortunately for me, who has never trained on how to deal with a uh, problematic judge, and in fact, grew up being more, I don't know what's the right word, a smart ass, um, said, oh really? I thought you were a judge. And that didn't go over well with that judge. So, uh, you know, I thought your job was to make a decision on whether you're disabled or whether the client is disabled or not. Right. And the reason I push back just a little bit and it's, and, and that's just kind of fun and ingest. Yes. It, it's disheartening as someone who does this over and over and over again, when you see one judge, you know, literally, and you and I know who the judge, the name, let's not name the judge, but right. you and I know there's a judge that pays 10 to 15 percent of the cases that come in in front of her. That's 15 out of 100 people that she somehow miraculously finds disabled. The national average is 45 out of 100 clients get found disabled in all the hearings across the board. And then you and I have been in front of judges that pay 70 percent of the people that come in front of them. So if the law was to be created equal, if the law was to be evaluated that way, why are some clients getting paid at the 10 to 15% rate and some clients are being paid at the 70% rate? You're 100% right about that. Each of us could come up with, when I was on the road for that national firm, I went to, I had a lot of air miles because I went to a remote hearing office where there were two judges one of them paid 9% and one of them paid 11%. And I was the only guy they could send up there who could crack any money out of the place. So that's why they sent me. And it was unfair. Now, your lawyer's job is to make it fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and so you and I agree about that. And judges should not consider the value of a claim. Just That's just an, exp an example to illustrate the magnitude of these claims. Yeah. Right. And to show you, we take it seriously. I, yeah, and I agree. I think knowing your audience, you know, if you know you're about to walk into a, a you know, a 10%, someone who pays 10 out of 100 people, which is far below the national average, I would refer you, I would be the client who's running to hire a lawyer, especially a lawyer who's been in front of that judge, because now, now you know, in order to win that case, you need to cross every T and dot every I. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, and I'll, we'll do a podcast, I'm sure, about this down the road. But not only are you trying to win the case, but if you are in front of one of those 10% pay of judges, you need to be protecting the record so that in case you need to go to United States District Court or federal court, you have res uh, preserved appeal rights and preserved the record in such a way that you can appeal on those things at a higher level because even those judges uh, are held accountable to a higher court. Yeah. Now, if a lawyer knows what he's doing, even if he expects to win, is is trying to perfect a record. Right. But it's but it's not easy. It's you know, that's it's not easy. Right. So number seven, we wrote I wrote down or we worked on is who else is gonna be in the hearing? And really understanding that. Um, what Maybe you can give some insight on who's involved in a hearing, who's in there, uh, you know, and uh, talk to our audience a little bit about that. First person you'll talk to is the judge's hearing assistant. Sometimes they call him a recorder. This is the person who runs all the recording and communications equipment. They get everybody else on the line. Or, and we're going to talk about a phone hearing. It's 
very similar for a video hearing. Yeah. They get everybody connected. There's you're, you and the judge. I will neglect the idea that there might be a lawyer there for a few minutes. There's you, the judge. There is almost certainly a, a vocational expert, an expert witness, and we'll talk about expert witnesses. There may well be a medical expert a doctor, a physician, or psychologist who has reviewed your records at the court's request and will be giving uh, uh, an opinion. So who else is in the room? At least you, you hope your lawyer, the judge who runs the show, the assistant who helps him out. You can bring your own witnesses. Our witnesses are sequestered. You'd have to have them standing by and waiting to get on the phone. And some judges don't want to hear from your witnesses, so you've got to have a reason you're going to call a witness. Um, but you can call witnesses in this court. You Generally, most judges don't want to hear from your doctor or your nurse practitioner. They want to hear from somebody who sees you and could explain what these problems you're going to testify to look like in daily life. Witnesses that help the court understand what they've already read about in the medical records, how that translates into real life. Right. Right. I think, yeah, I think the only part to that I would add, and I don't want to deep dive too much into the vocation. I mean, we could do a whole hour on who the vocational expert is, which is, you know, a jobs expert, and then a whole nother hour on who the medical expert is and different types of medical experts. Let me throw a couple of just FAQs or frequently asked questions that I'll get from clients. I, I happen to know the answer or how I would answer it. Uh, and see what what your response would be. Is the medical expert going to evaluate me, like in a sense, like if I'm the client, their evaluate me, Johnny, on the spot during the hearing? Their opinion is strictly based on the medical records that are in the file, which is a good reason to make sure your file is complete and up to date. They pay special attention to. Uh, they're usually specialists of some kind, so they'll pay special attention to. Um, testing or imaging any sort of objective findings and exams that pertain to their specialty. So, no, they don't physically examine you. They read your medical records. That's the basis for their testimony. Will the expert witnesses ask me any questions? They may ask you questions. Now, there's two kinds. There's the vocational expert and the medical expert. Judges are sometimes reluctant to let the medical expert ask you questions, but they'll generally defer as long as it's not too intrusive. They'll be simple questions. You should be able to answer them. It'll be like, do you have trouble breathing? Or when do you hear these voices? Or how much can you lift? Um, it'll be short, simple questions, and you won't have to give a lot of detailed medical explanation. Right. Kind of the same for the vocational expert. Short, simple questions about your work history. Did you have to type? Did you have to talk on the phone? How much did you have to lift? Did you go up ladders and scaffolds? Things like that. So they may ask you some questions. And if you're prepared to testify, you won't have any problem with the question. So one of the things we encourage our clients to do, uh, for the, specifically for the vocational expert part of the testimony, and the judge may or a lot of judges will ask, and some of them will go job by job by job for every job the person has done in the last 15 years. One of the things they're looking at is way back in the beginning of the case when a client first applies, they, are look, they have to fill out this work history questionnaire. And one of the things the judge goes through is that work history questionnaire, as well as the detailed earnings query, which Social Security, I believe, gets from uh, the IRS or it just gets printed out as for what uh, they paid into FICA. And so it lists the name of the employer and how much they made at each employer. I've had judges go through that whole thing, um, job by job by job. And as you and I both know, they're asking like, oh, how long did you work there? Did you have... How long did you have to sit? How much weight did you lift? Did you work there full-time or part-time? And it can be, you know, in some cases, if you have people who have 35 jobs listed there in the last 15 years, that can take quite a while to work through that. Um, I don't always believe it's relevant, but some judges love to go through that because that's what yeah. they learn to do um, at judges school. So, uh, So, yeah, I think, you know, kind of getting back to the bigger point is uh, knowing who's in the room, uh, what to be prepared to ask, you know, especially if it's a vocational expert, because it's very rare. I wouldn't say rare, but it's 
unusual for me when I'm in here to not ask, and we, and again, I don't want to deep dive into it, but to not ask a vocational expert, at least a hypothetical question, right? And it can take a good six to 12 months to train a, a new lawyer just on how to ask the right hypothetical questions uh, to the vocational expert, let alone if you're going to go in there by yourself and do the hearing by yourself. You know, I think, I, go ahead. I, I give, a, I give when, I, when I do my final prep with a witness before a hearing, I give, um, I can give a pretty detailed explanation of the role of the vocational expert. I do it mostly out of respect. I just don't want them to have to sit and listen to three people talk about them, then not follow the conversation. Right. Um, but I also think it helps. Um, it helps, like I said, you know the target you're shooting at. Um, right. Because there are errors in their opinions. They misunderstand explanations. And it is a valuable piece of evidence for, you know, that's one of the places... Uh, that the client can do some getting ready as far as I, I want to be able to remember how much do I have to lift a case of beer or a keg of beer when I worked at that restaurant, things like that. Right, right. Uh, and then clear up any discrepancies that may have been put down in, in the work history report. I, I remember seeing people check the box, I'm a manager, when in reality they were like not a manager. <laughs> you know, they right. managed, managed themselves. You know, I was the night clerk and I worked by myself and I, my boss said I was the night manager. Well, you know, when we think of a traditional manager from the perspective of a uh, a vocational expert, you know, were you in charge of hiring and firing? Were you in charge of shift uh, scheduling the shifts? Things of that nature. So I think those are, you know, again, refer the point one, uh, hiring a lawyer who might be able to prepare you for a vocational expert. The other thing, too, about a medical expert, and I know we're going long here, but- That's right. A medical expert, when I cross-examine, and I'm curious to ask you this, and I don't want to totally dive too deep into it, but knowing the listings is extremely important. Or what, and you know, I don't have them memorized, but knowing how to apply the medical records to the listing is extremely important because one of the first questions that a judge asks of a medical expert is, does this claimant meet or equal a listing? And, you know, if you don't, if you're not prepared, because you may think, especially your background of knowing the medical rec or how to read a medical file, Jack, if you don't know the listings, you're not going to be able to cross-examine that medical expert to be like, hey, look, I do think she actually meets a listing. Did you consider A, B, C, C and D? I mean, are there any other things, too, that you do to prepare outside of that as well or for a medical expert? No, the joke I make when I'm explaining experts is there's, there's only two good ways to get ready to cross-examine. If we were in a regular trial court, there'd be pretrial discovery. Everyone would know what this person was going to say. All, all of us hear this opinion for the first time when the doctor testifies. And for that reason, there's no good way to get ready to cross-examine them except know the medical file as well as they do and cross-examine a couple hundred other doctors over 25 years. Right. And and then you're ready for it. Right. Right. So the eighth thing we wrote down um, is be prepared to give a quick, uh, short and brief opening statement um, and or a closing argument uh, and or a quick theory of your case. Um, I guess, how often are you doing that in here? I always have one ready. I always have one ready. And depending on the case, it might be three or four sentences, or it might be 30 seconds. But I always have one ready. Sometimes I really want to give one. I want to tell the judge, here's something, here's a way I look at the case, or here's something you're going to learn in testimony, Your Honor, that you wouldn't fully understand from the record. And it speaks to this part of the grid case or this part of the listing. So I, I'm, I'm letting the court know I'm going to examine the witness on that or you might want to, sir. Um, it's a way to get the court thinking, a way to, to shorten up the hearing by identifying issues. It's a way to get the court thinking your way or find out where the weaknesses in your case are. So I always have a short one ready. And sometimes if the judge just wants to 
Sometimes if, if it's a judge who doesn't want to hear him, I'll say, Your Honor, I hope you'll hear me in a brief opening statement. Because it's not like a trial court. I'm not explaining the whole file. But there might be something about the case that I really want the judge to be thinking about before that you wouldn't know from having read the file. Right. That's right. Right. that's my thought on that. No, I, I, I think that's great. I, I would say just as a percentage wise, I would say probably 85 percent of the hearings I've been in, you know, I, I'm like you. I'm always prepared to give an opening statement uh, or or a um, theory of the case. But I'd say about that only happens that happens about eighty five percent of the hearings I'm in, um, you know, give or take. I, I I haven't actually tracked the number, but I'm guessing. Um, the one thing I'll say about opening statements: if you're a layperson going in, you need to know what the target is. You need to know what you're trying to prove. And if you don't know what the sequential evaluation is and how the judge is literally going through that five step process. You're going to have a really difficult time giving an opening statement. And so it's the elements of the law that, you know, kind of direct us in how we present a case, what the issues are. Like if there is substantial gainful activity or SGA during the relevant time frame, how do, what are we going to do with that? Are we going to argue change the onset date or argue unsuccessful work attempt? And that may need to be addressed in the opening statement. And I know I'm using probably some foreign languages for some of our listeners here, but again, and and you and I can do a podcast on all of these little, you know, things. What is a successful work attempt or what is, you know, SGA uh, or the sequential evaluation? I think it just goes to point back to number one, <laughs> you know, if you don't want to learn it. And if even if you do learn it, the judge may be like, wow, how did you learn all this? And then use that against you in your social security hearing, right? And so it's a catch-22, right? Like, man, you're will, really well-spoken. You did a great job. How did you learn all of this? Oh, Judge, I, I studied all this to get prepared for the hearing. Oh, really? Okay, thank you. Denied. You know, go back to work. Um, anyway, that's my two cents on the opening statement. Uh, and then I think number nine, we talked about already. I mean, unless you have something else to add, we talked about be prepared to cross-examine your expert witnesses. Um, do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, not, not a lot. Just kind of to put it in not one place, two places. The vocational experts and medical experts are very different. Uh, vocational experts is a very specific way to cross-examine them. Right. I, I, it's, it's, there's not many other witnesses you'll ask hypothetical questions of. There's not many, there's no other witnesses who specialize in this field. So it's very idiosyncratic and it's an interesting part of the practice because you don't get it any place else. Right. Medical right. witnesses, uh, just to put that in one place, uh, if you're going to argue with a doctor about medicine, you better hope it's not your first time trying it. Right. Right. I wanted to add something on that I, uh, since we're talking about witnesses, and I know number nine was about expert witnesses, but lay witnesses, you know, how then your wife or your significant other, you know, uh, parent, friend, roommate, come in and testify uh, on your behalf. Judges are generally cranky about it. In my experience, you know, are they going to tell me anything I haven't already heard? Right. And if they're just going to be repeating what you've already said as the claimant in your testimony, because you'll testify first. Oh, and by the way, I'll throw this little plug in. There's a mock hearing on our website under client resources tab that you can go watch and see how a hearing is generally performed. Okay. And that hearing, we didn't do a witness, uh, a, a, a third party, a lay witness. What I encourage clients to do is just get it in writing and turn it in as a sworn affidavit. Uh, have your significant other write something up and then get it in five full business days before before the hearing. Um, and so, because generally judges don't like lay witnesses to come in because it's a time suck is basically what I've heard. Um, and just send me something in writing. So... Those are the nine things that I think, you know, clients should consider um, and that, you know, we consider in preparing for 
hearings. And if you're going to go at it alone, because you know, I don't know who's going to watch this video, I hope these tips are helpful, but I will encourage you. You should go hire a lawyer. It's not going to cost you out of pocket. If they are going to charge you out of pocket, um, I think that's a violation of social security rules. Uh, it has to be on a contingency fee. I mean, Grant, I, at least that's how I read the law. Um, and so, you know, but I would strongly encourage you to go uh, hire a lawyer, whether it's our firm, who I think we're the best at what we do, obviously, and I'm biased uh, biased to that uh, opinion. Uh, but definitely use these nine tips um, to try to, you know, understand how to prepare for your social security disability hearing. You add anything to add other than what we've talked about? No, and you're right. I hope it is. There are some people who will want to try this themselves even after having heard this. Um, feel free to call us after you get a decision from the judge, ah. and we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, but otherwise, good luck. And I'm, I'm, and I'm glad that people at least have a frame of reference and know what this is about. Yeah. So listen, Jack, as always, thank you for uh, your time today. And it, you know, I don't know how long we've been going, but it's been a while. Um, and I, uh, appreciate you. Uh, and, uh, for those who want to know more about Jack, we have a, a podcast, uh, with John Edward Cahill, the third, uh, you can watch and learn about, uh, uh, my good friend, Jack. And, uh, and then I would encourage you, we have a mock hearing video on our, uh, YouTube channel. Watch that. We, uh, you know, and you can visit our website, uh, evansdisability.com. Uh, and to watch some of those uh, other videos that we've done about hearings, about forms. Uh, and if you're interested in hiring a lawyer, reach out. Um, and uh, we'd be glad to, uh, you know, glad to interview you and see if we can help. Um, yeah. And then please subscribe. All of that good stuff. All right. Thanks, Jack. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Peter. Talk to you soon.